Hello everyone and welcome to this week's installment of Dating with Decorix, Love Island of Zoom. Taking part in today's show is Tova Osad, Renata Kaminker and Giovanni Sard. Let's see if I can feel a digital spark when discussing the logistical, business and ethical factors interior designers should be considering beyond just the purchase of an artwork. Let me start by asking each of you to introduce yourselves and to give us an insight into the work that you do. Renata. Oh, hello. Thank you for having me today. So I'm a paintings conservator. I live and I studied in Paris. I live here now and I work all over Europe. I have experience in museums and private collections and with also institutions and professionals in the field in general. And my work is around conservation, assisting with preventive conservation, risk management, advising on uh, different measures to uh, safeguard artworks in houses and in museums. Thank you, Renata. And Tova? Um, so my name is Tova and I started my company a year and a half ago. I specialize in uh, art transport and logistics as well as collections management. So after 15 years of working in galleries, I decided to focus more on the administrative side of, um, of the art buying process and questions that need to be asked in terms of the physical movement of pieces. Thank you, Dover. And last but not least, Giovanni. Thank you. Um, my name is Giovanni, as I've been introduced by Brian, and I have extensively researched risk management policies and practices during my academic um, background and I sort of is Institute of Art where I now host lectures uh, on this topic and I started my career at sort of is within the evaluation department which was um, which was an incredibly an incredible experience I was very lucky and I am now account executive for loan market insurance where we uh, basically manage uh, corporate global uh, programs for um, commercial galleries as well as multinational brands and we also assist private collectors and we provide them with bespoke um, insurance contracts to look after their legacy through generations, basically. Thank you. Um, so a piece that I will be personally bidding on <laughs> is becoming available uh, or being offered by Sotheby's New York during their annual Masters Week sales series in January 2021. And that's Botticelli's Young Man Holding a Round L. Um, Toga. What does a buyer need to be aware of um, when, when looking at purchasing a piece at, at auction? Well, I'm just gonna start from the basics of what an auction actually looks like. You have to imagine a sort of live performance with audience participation and a conductor at a rostrum. You have the auctioneer who are trained, um, they have to be licensed who are calling out bids to people either in the audience, on the telephone, or even online, which is happening a lot more recently, even pre-COVID, that was starting to become a big trend. And bidders put out uh, what they're willing to bid on by raising their hand or a paddle. And at the uh, sort of hit of the, the auctioneer's gavel is something called the hammer price, which is the amount that the bidder or the buyer at that point will have to pay. Um, on top of that, and this is always important to remember because there are two prices in auction. There's a hammer price and a final price. And the final price includes something called a buyer's premium, which is essentially the auction house's commission on the sale. And um, every auction house does this differently. So you really need to check what the buyer's premium percentages actually are because they're tiered. And that way you can have a complete sort of scope as to what buy in an auction actually, um, actually feels like in the moment. I learned about the, the buyer's premiums the hard way when I purchased. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> I bet. It's a mistake to me. Yeah, but the thing about, you know, and this is why this conversation is interesting, especially when it comes to an auction is because an auction has a very distinct before, and obviously there's the buying, and then there's a distinct after. Um, so if I was gonna purchase the Botticelli, the first thing I would do is, besides check my bank account, is I would call Giovanni and I would say, what do I need? <laughs> like, can I cover this? And then I would call Renata and say, what do I need to ask the specialists because auction houses have departments where there are specialists who research and who work. Um, 
and I know Renata is nodding her head because she knows <laughs> way better than I do all of the questions that needed that need to be asked. Um, so maybe let's go on that journey. So Giovanni, what what type of questions should an interior designer assisting their their clients on a uh, an art purchase or a, a client purchasing directly be be asking when purchasing something like an old master's um, true auction in New York? From my personal experience, usually when such important artworks are bought at auction, they rarely stay within the boundaries of New York City where they have been bought. They usually get uh, shipped overseas or they travel a long way before arriving to the storage location or to the um, private property where they're going to be basically held for a while. And certainly insurance is a key point to to address here because for such an important artwork you would you need to start uh, looking for it in advance you cannot leave it last minute mm -hmm. and you can it's very difficult to do to ensure a single item if not impossible especially of such high values uh, of such high value and so what you need to do is either um, check with the shipper if they can if you can insure it with them or um, make sure that you can include these artwork under your annual contract. If you are lucky enough to have an important collection with a um, large insurance program on it, it's, it's super easy to include it. Uh, if your collection, however, is just is growing and this artwork is going to be the top item of your collection, you need to make sure that you know, the insurers that are actually insuring you at the moment would be happy to insure it. And Certainly, another thing you need to look into are the conditions in which you ensure the artwork. Um, many contracts, as a, the, the key um, item in a contract, in an insurance contract, is the, are the basis of valuation. Uh, in case of a loss, that is uh, where you are going to look at in terms of the value you're going to get um, for the loss you have experienced. So. A standard policy wording would usually have a basis of valuation where the insurer, uh, in case of a loss, uh, in case of partial damage, can whether decide to pay for the restoration and refund you of the loss in value of the artwork or basically declare that the artwork cannot be restored or just simply refund you for the total value of the item and take possession of the artwork itself. So you would basically lose the artwork. For, for an important First item as, such as this one, it's scary. <laughs> yeah, it's scary. <laughs> something, you don't know how, how it's gonna turn out. Yeah, so that's the point of insurance. For yeah. private collectors, uh, it's very important um, to check the, the basis of valuation in the contract and top fine art uh, specialist insurer uh, for important private collectors worldwide um, the specialist wording can also leave this liberty of deciding what to do, whether to get it restored and get a refund on the loss in value or have it, the total, total refund and just let the artwork go. So this decision can be left to the collector. In terms of the valuation, is that determined based on the Hammer Plus buyer's premium? Is there a separate valuation that needs to be carried out on the piece? How is, it, how is the value determined? This is another very important thing to check in the basis of valuation and you need to make sure that when you buy this artwork, I would advise to insure it in the contract at an agreed value. So basically before uh, inception of the contract, you agree a value which is agreed between you and insurers so that in case of a loss, the value is agreed and there is no dispute around it. Okay, thank you. Is that, more, Renata, so is that more difficult to do if the, ins the, the shipper is the one who's insuring it? Because in a lot of situations, a shipper can, can as a one-off, insure for the transit of a piece. It's obviously at a much higher cost. So what do you do in that? Is that, isn't that, how does, how is that value agreed? Um, my advice would be to have an annual insurance contract where you can include such circumstances so that you don't have to rely on the shipper because different shippers obviously offer you different conditions. And it's usually more expensive to insure the one-off transits with a shipper than to have an annual insurance policy where you can include such, such transits. 
Okay. And, and Renata, I'm looking forward to working with you. Another on important thing as well, sorry, about the insurance is before the shipment and upon collection and upon delivery of the artwork is a, a, a key item that you absolutely need to have is conditions report. You need to make sure the conditions report of the item when you collect it and when you deliver it, because if there is a loss and the collector calls you two days after the artwork has been delivered and say the artwork is scratched, you need to make sure, you need to understand first of all when that happened and the condition of the article when it was delivered. So that's certainly something that Renata would be absolutely knowledgeable about. Renata, maybe you can elaborate on that further. So a condition report. A condition report is a document that states at a key time, what is the state of the artwork? It includes pictures and includes a detailed description, things that you will find in any inventory file, of course, size, weight, uh, and title, description, and general description of the image, but also pictures back from the back, the front, uh, the sides, raking light. If it's well done, you'll have also a UV light depending on the artwork, especially in old masters like this Botticelli. If I'm going to have a client who's going to buy this uh, artwork, the first thing I'll ask them is, please ask for the condition report. Please make sure that there is UV light pictures in it, meaning the artwork was put under UV light and you see the actual state of conservation. UV lights let you know how much it has been restored and or whether it has been restored. In the cases of old masters, there's always going to be restoration. That is fine. If you move into more modern contemporary artworks, it will depend, of, co of course, on the piece, and it will be an indication of how much damage it has undergone. Um, I would, uh, yes? Uh, and in the case of an old masters, um, yes. is the frame as important? Does it have uh, the same condition report uh, accompanying it? Yes. Absolutely. The frame also needs to have its own condition report. And in the condition report, of course, you have to take a picture of the painting inside the frame to make sure how it looks. Mm -hmm. And it should be outside the frame too, because the frames can also damage artwork. So you need to know exactly what state the borders are in. Okay. So I would always advise front, back, inside and out, outside of frames. And, and condition reports are pretty standard. They look the same no matter the kind of, of the value of purchase that you're making. Um, Absolutely. Is, is, Absolutely. There a, is there other, the, the UV and, and the, the basic uh, image that you spoke of, is there anything else that somebody should be looking for within a condition report? First of all, the pictures, the image, they need to be what we call readable, meaning it doesn't only have to be a very clear picture of, that lets you see what's going on, but you have to be able to understand what is the damage. And a conservator should be able to understand the extent of the damage, and should the piece be moved, will there be further damage from there? That's what we call a readable image. Okay. It should be as detailed as possible, but at the same time, it shouldn't take you more than 10 minutes to get all of the information. It's one of those concise and detailed at the same time. And condition reports nowadays, more and more, you can see actually a small two, three paragraphs at the beginning or end of the document that says, that gives you a general summary of what's going on, yeah. the condition. Um, if there are any transportation advice, is there any transportation advice given by the conservator? Is there any conservation advice, for example, that can be provided? Are there any specificities? All of those will be included in condition reports. Mm -hmm. If any of that information is missing, you should ask for it. And beyond the, the condition report, are there other elements that you would be looking at um, prior to a buyer making a, a bid on a piece like this? Well, having worked a little bit on illicit trafficking issues, I would ask for the documentation, the full documentation on the provenance. Yep. And if there is any um, hesitance in giving me that documentation, I would call that a red flag. There shouldn't be any issue in providing the full history of the piece as far as uh, the previous owner knows, mm -hmm. and the seller should have done their work too in this aspect. Okay. Uh, and Toba, do you have anything that you'd like to add uh, on, on that part? Well, I think that it's Giovanni and, and Renata covered a lot, so much, um, especially about the connection between condition reports and insurance. What I think I can add is that that's a lot about before but after something's been bought, I mean, we've said this is Sotheby's New York. So if you're buying something in the States, for example, everywhere has, every state has different sales tax laws. So in New York, for example, if you want, if you're a collector in Europe and you wanted to ship something, 
then the company in New York would have to do it for you within a three month period in order for you to avoid paying New York sales tax, which I think is eight and a half percent, which sounds low compared to our 20% VAT, but you know, you're trying to save money. Thank you here in some of these $80 million on a Botticelli. So I think there are always, you always have to check what the laws are, especially if you're buying in the States in terms of sales tax, but also, you know, Brexit, we can talk about this later as Brexit comes, what that actually means in terms of shipping and movement. And I think from my perspective, the important thing to remember is that movement is, it, it is physical. Um, and we can, you know, insurance and condition reports and all of that documentation is really important because it has to correspond with the actual physical movement of something that's very valuable from point A to point B. Um, and, and that's, and that's, and I would advise that that's something you have to sort of visualize that as a buyer. Okay. So that's, that's sort of, uh, explains the process in purchasing an auction and purchasing something like an old masters. Um, let's use a different example now, uh, a contemporary piece uh, by Sophie bovier Auslander, uh, a gouache on wax paper, currently being exhibited by Patrick Cady at Contemporary Art London. Um, what would be the, 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 the approach to making a purchase like this from a gallery? Um, what would the first steps be? Um, and Renata, what, how would you approach this kind of a purchase? Uh, as always, we go back, of course, to the condition report, but I would also start thinking about how it will go into wherever it's going to be presented once the buyer has it. Because with pieces like this, they tend to be a little bit more on the fragile side, mm -hmm. meaning it is a uh, gouache, it is, which is, tends to be more brittle. So how will I transport it? I will look at that. Where will I put it? Because it is an artwork on paper. There's the fact that it's a uh, water-based uh, painting on an oil-based uh, medium because it's waxed paper. So long-term conservation is involved. So while at the moment of purchase, I will do the usual, what is what condition is it in? As I'm buying it, I'm also going to be thinking, well, where's, where's it going to go? Am mm -hmm. I going to frame it? In which case you will have to look at framing options. This is a piece where I would look more at the long-term conservation of it, which is a general question with all contemporary art, since there's a mixture of mediums that all masters, we know exactly how it works and they knew what they were doing. Where in contemporary art, there's a lot of experimentation. So you have to always remember that whatever answers you will be looking for, there is no such thing as a general one size fits all. Hmm. So I would be looking at every, every single time at what am I dealing with? Where is it going? How will it be tra traveling? Uh, beyond, of course, the insurance issues and all the paperwork, how physically will it be traveling? Uh, does the transportation company create a crate, an isotherm crate for it? And if not, why? Because it, it's, are we talking a very short transportation, just a few kilometers, maybe two hours away? Or is it going all the way to Japan from the US? In which case, where it's something completely different. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I would look more into the after rather than the actual moment of buying. Yeah. And Giovanni, what questions can a buyer ask a gallery that will help form opinions or, or judgments for the insurance company in, in setting premiums for insuring a piece of art like this? Well, the premium is very much set on the nature of the artwork and basically the type of shipment the artwork is, gonna, is going to have. For an important artwork such as the Botticelli, obviously you're going to look at a shipment done by a specialized finance packer and shipper because there's no other way you would be able to move that. For lower value items, you could use couriers like FedEx, DHL, even if um, you have, you, we, you see most of the losses happen is, are accidental damages, most of them in transit. So it is, you can insure it, but it's advisable always to use a fine art packer and shipper, uh, which is specialized and they know what they do. Um, and it's not a guarantee, but it definitely, definitely reduces the likelihood of incurring into any surprises when the artwork is delivered. Um, it's very important, as Renata was saying as well, to ask the correct questions in terms of conservation. Preventing conservation is key, and many collectors, especially when they start collecting artworks, they think that preventing conservation and insurance go on two separate ways meaning either I conserve either or I, I insure it so I don't need to conserve it. 
um, that could be a mistake because gradual deterioration, wear and tear, oxidation are items which are, are general exclusion and you cannot insure for those. So you really need the help of a conservator to make sure that preventive conservation measures are in place uh, because otherwise you're going to incur damages we can, you cannot insure. And do insurance companies typically recommend uh, a team that they want to put in place or is it can, can you turn to specialists like Renata um, to, to assist on this? So in brokers and insurers, uh, we don't provide valuations, we don't provide security advice, legal advice. Uh, so that's something you would have to seek um, advice from a third party advisor such as Renata or Tova and insurers, um, they have their contacts, the people they work with, and they would be happy to point you in the right direction. If the, the collector, if the insurer has any preferences, obviously, um, you can present them to your broker and then your broker can present it to the underwriters and you can find an agreement. But it's, it's a team, it's a team uh, job. It's not something that either the conservator, the insurer, uh, or an art advisor can, can take on their shoulders on their own because we all uh, play a different role in, in the and, and life of these artworks. Tova, what, what should a buyer be considering in terms of the logistics? You know, they've, they've purchased a piece, it's being delivered to their home. Long term, what should they be doing and putting in place to, to protect themselves or protect the asset, especially if they're moving it from country to country during its lifetime and just staying it in different properties? Right. So I think, I mean, that's sort of a, um, that's a question that needs to be sort of broken apart. Um, if you are considering something, the first thing you have to think of, and I know this seems very basic, but here we are, uh, is size. Um, how big is this? Um, because that's a huge factor in what a shipping company is going to charge you, size and weight. Um, it also matters where it's going. If it's crossing an ocean, it needs a different kind of crate versus if it's going on a truck um, to Paris to be with Renata. Um, it's, there are all these different factors that go into it. Um, size is always a consistent issue. Um, where it goes then becomes the next consideration for a shipping company. And of course, how it's meant to be wrapped and created. The good thing, and like Renata said, old masters, they, we knew what they were doing. We know a lot of processes. There are certain camps on how certain things are meant to be done, but they usually come to a general consensus. Yeah, you're nodding your head. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, I'm right. The more and, general rules apply to old masters than right. contemporary. Um, and with contemporary work, you know, sometimes the good thing is that an artist is still around, so you can ask. And I'm um, actually something. This is. So, I mean, a few weeks ago, Brian and I went to um, something at Modernity House in London. They did a, an, ex, a, uh, an exhibition with Adrian Sassoon that was sort of their Scandinavian furniture and Adrian Sassoon works. And we were looking for works for a client and we found something from one of Brian's clients that was wool felt with Japanese ink and clay that was not fired in a kiln, but rather um, dried with a hairdryer. It was Very really awesome. cool. The, the artist's name, uh, Fernando Palasempere. Chilean. And it was great because we were there and we were talking about, because the client wanted it in a very specific place that's close to a radiator. And we were, you know, talking about this a little bit and the artist walked in and he described the process and how he created this piece. And it was all, you know, very interesting and all of that. And then afterward, Brian and I were talking about it because Brian had spoken to his client and the radiator came up right? What do we do? Um, and I said to Brian, well, the client needs to email the gallery because, you know, Giovanni would tell me to do my due diligence and check with the gallery and make sure that I, <laughs> I have all of the information. But the gallery said they would speak to the artist. Um, yeah. You know, the, the director from Adrian Sassoon said, we need to ask the artist. And there's something great about that, especially with contemporary work, is that an artist, especially in this area of the Auslander, which is slightly more affordable, and I say affordable because it's in the thousands, not the hundreds of millions, um, 
because it you can you can have contact with artists and that's mm-hmm. actually special. Um, but I bet Giovanni would tell me that I did something wrong and that I should have done <laughs> something actually, else. I, I'm just going to ask uh, Giovanni a point on that. So uh, my client in question hangs the piece of art over a radiator and hasn't reached out to uh, Adrian Sassoon's team and the artist directly to ask for their advice and opinion. Further down the, the road, uh, something goes wrong with the piece of art. Where does the client stand uh, on in terms of insurance uh, and having insured that piece? Is it down to not locating it correctly, not taking advice? And if they, in this case, they have sought advice and if they get confirmation that it is absolutely fine to hang it 30 centimeters above the radiator, um, having that in writing and if something still goes wrong later, is the client protected? So with cont- contemporary art, usually it's, I would say more fragile than items such old masters because old masters already kind of like pass the test of time. So what we have now is already the selection of what has survived the test of time. Whilst contemporary art, it's here now and it's going somewhere, but we don't really know where. So it's really important to know, the con- to have the po- a point of view uh, from the conservator with their recommendations on how to keep the artwork. Mm. Uh, for this artwork specifically, um, keeping on top of a radiator would cause gradual deterioration to it, which would not be insured. Um, so that is really something the collector should look into because insurance would not cover such such loss. If, however, there was to there was an accidental damage to the artwork. Um, being a contemporary artwork, e- insurers would e- usually they reach out to the, the artist and the restoration of the artwork is done in collaboration with the artist as well. So having a living artist in a sense in case of accidental damages is also kind of um, not a guarantee. You never, you never have a guarantee, but um, it's helpful because they can help. Sometimes they just look at the piece of art and they say, no, this cannot do, be restored. This needs to be destroyed because it's, the damage is irreparable. So in that case, um, you have an artist's advice that might be conflicting with the collector uh, mm-hmm. point of view. So that and, might be difficult. And Renata, um, conservation or, or restoration of a contemporary art piece, uh, this piece in particular is very organic and it, there were yes. multiple pieces very similar, but this was the one. You can't necessarily recreate something like this again. What, what oh, happens? You, you know, the insurance company wants to restore it and work with the with the artist to recreate it, but the magic is gone. is literally gone. Uh, what happens then, and what what's the discussion like at that point? Well, there's actually several things that you need to look at. First of all, um, we apply the plus or minus twenty percent rule, meaning uh, is it under twenty percent damaged? It, it is. It, we will look at a, rest- a possible restoration. At around 20%, we will ask the question, do the proper research and really think about it and debate. Mm-hmm. Over 20%, we advise just to do the minimal necessary to conserve, but not to actually restore it to its original state. That's a general rule. Now, contemporary artists, uh, contemporary art, as Tova very well said, you reach out to the contemporary artist, to the creator. If he says, I want to completely restore, do whatever, it takes, you do all the proper work for it. Um, you work alongside with the artist in a piece such as this one, especially because it's made out of organic materials. You will need to work with the, with the artist himself to be able to acquire the materials again and recreate the piece as he intended. Mm-hmm. If uh, you can't reach the artist or if the artist says, I do not want the piece to be restored at all, that is another debate in itself, which needs to start because it is usually said from a conservation point of view, the artist has the final say. Mm. From a collector's point of view, I understand that no, the collector, he just bought that piece. That's his final say. In which case we usually recommend a sort of mediation meeting, an informal sit down and say, well, how can we do this? Yep. What can be done? Um, we look of course at insurance, uh, what could be done from the insurance side <laughs> to help out here. Uh, it is, uh, Pieces like this one can be very simple and very complicated at the same time. Sounds and it like all depends on this 20% ruling and the saying of the artist. Sounds like a Zoom call I don't want to be on. Um, <laughs> before we start to, sorry, yes, Giovanni. 
sorry. Uh, this point that Renate that, that Renata was was mentioning is very important because it gives you the idea of how important it is to have insurers that are knowledgeable about art, that they know what they're doing and they know what they're dealing with. So what you want is really a specialized um, fine art insurance contract, because if you just get a standard insurance contract for uh, your household for, and including the content, all of these fine tuning of the cover might not be possible. So when the loss actually occurs, um, you might have surprises. Okay. But I think that that's a general, a good general rule, sorry, for every, every part of this is that if you have specialists, because value, something could be that's a thousand pounds could be expensive to me and of low value to you. So value is always a relative term and, and, I, and I hate going there. Um, but I think that if you have specialist people and experts working on these issues with any kind of art purchase, you will fundamentally be in a better position in the long run. Because if, you know, if your client didn't think about, didn't have somebody like you or me to say, uh oh, a radiator might be a problem, then, then they could have caught, been caught out 10 years down the line. They're looking at this piece and it could be coming apart. We just don't know. You, you have to have, local knowledge. And especially now that travel is more difficult. I know nobody likes talking about the pandemic. I'm sick of it too, especially it's after here. Two weeks of quarantine, just finishing two weeks of quarantine. But I, that's a huge aspect, local knowledge, finding experts in places, talking to specialists, like what we were talking about with the Botticelli, talking to galleries like Patrick Haida, who, who are very open and who you need to trust to give you information, talking to people like me who can get you the best, because a shipper is not a one size fits all. You know, you might need something that's specific from a specific art shipper that one can get you and another one can. Mm. You, you know, a conservator, you know, Renata can look at something and say, oh, a Chinese painting. I don't, I don't, I don't know if you know, but you, you yeah. know, there, there are it's all of these. You're right, there are all these specialist in this case yeah you need there are specialists and yes value is relative um but but no matter what it means to you it's making sure that the process is not just simple but well managed um, from all different aspects from a customs perspective i know what the paperwork is supposed to look like yeah. uh, i know what a, how to work through the difficulties of what HMRC versus the Douane in France versus the Dogana in Italy, they what to expect. And I think that's a really important point to drive home with all of this is that perspective before, those areas. There, before we run out of time today, there was another topic that nobody likes or enjoys discussing. And I think it's important to touch on it before we finish up and that's Brexit um, and how that's going to have an impact on the landscape of art purchasing going forward. Um, Who would like to stick the toe into that topic? <laughs> this is my specialty. I love talking about Brexit because <laughs> I, I live learning about it. Um, businesses and private collectors obviously for Brexit is different. So I don't wanna go into specifics of each of those, but I think what the important things to remember, and I, I hate to be the sort of negative Nancy, but prices go up because waiting times go up because mm -hmm. the longer you have something sitting in a truck at Dover, the more men you need to have on that truck because of, because of international trucking laws, which means the longer it's also sitting, which means your insurance might not like it so much. So they might say, oh, well, my pre your premium is gonna go up because you have decided to put it on a truck that's going through Dover as opposed to on a plane. Um, you need to make sure that all of your paperwork is in order and that you've paid the appropriate import VAT because there's going to be after the first, from the 1st of January, 2021, there will be 5% import VAT on artworks uh, coming into the UK from outside of the UK, whereas previously it could have been outside of the EU. So if you buy your Botticelli in the United States and it comes to you, you pay your 5% on whatever uh, massive price tag um, you've <laughs> certainly purchased it for um, in the UK. 
Um, so you paid your 5%, you have it hanging on your home in your home in London. And then let's say you decide that no, you wanted to go to your summer house um, in Tuscany. So you then have to send it to your summer house in Tuscany and pay the import VAT for Italy. So there are lots of considerations. And what I would say is that for Brexit, for anybody who's purchasing art, thinking about purchasing art, it's a much more of a long-term plan. You need to know what you're gonna do with it, when you're going to do it, and you need to make sure that you keep everything that's associated with it from condition reports to insurance to make sure that you have all of that in place because unfortunately, and we don't have all of the answers yet, unfortunately it's gonna get more complicated. Thank you for touching on, on that particular topic. Um, we're running out of time, but I'd like to ask all three of you um, for one piece of advice you'd give to any interior designer out there who are assisting their clients navigate the art world. Maybe Renata, could I start with you? Um, I would actually give two. The first one, remember, there's no one size fits all, especially in contemporary artwork, but even with old masters, there's always going to be little differences, which leads to number two, don't be afraid to ask questions. It's impossible to know everything and not everybody, nobody can know absolutely everything. So if one person can't give you the answer or the fullest answer as you would like to have it, don't be afraid to ask for that to the next one. Ask for all the documentation, the paperwork, the pictures. The more questions you ask, especially in conservation, the better you'll be off. Thank you. And G Giovanni? I would advise to plan in advance. Take your time to plan and to put all necessary insurance arrangements, shipping arrangements, uh, import export uh, arrangements in place in due time. Don't leave it last minute because last minute it might not be possible to do and it might create delay and it's never it's never a pleasant pleasant experience. And you also might end up uh, picking up the first quotation you get and you might end up paying more. If you allow your broker as well, in terms of insurance, to be able to search the market and provide you with alternative quotation, you might have to be to get better terms as well. Okay, and Toba. Um, I also have two. Um, my first is touching on what I said before. Uh, find experts who know what they're talking about and who you can trust, because you have to trust the experts who you work with. Um, and believe in what they tell you. Um, so that's the first. And my second is really boring. Um, keep all of your paperwork. And I know that sounds so obvious, but I have so many clients who say, oh, did I need to keep that invoice? I didn't know that. Um, or, oh, a transit now? Why, why would I need that? Because you never know. And it goes into what Giovanni said about long-term planning. It means you have everything at your disposal so that when you make a plan, all of the information that somebody might ask for is there. And Thank keep you. them maybe a copy and stored in a separate place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All the and and Take hard. that to the extreme. <laughs> Keep a backup. Yeah. Yeah. If your collection is a museum collection, all of the paperwork, all the files. Yeah. If the museum <laughs> goes on fire, you want the paperwork be stored not all together with the artworks. Yeah. No, no, and you're right, but keep everything, backups, Scan, keep, have all of that because you will always need it and you never know when that will happen. Well, thank you all for such a wonderful speed dating session. I know I've learned a lot and I hope everybody else who's going to be viewing this will uh, uh, have learned a lot from it too. And thank you to Decorex for having us to discuss the fundamentals of art. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that uh, quick costume change, everybody. Um, I'll dive straight into our Q&A. We've got quite a lot of questions coming in. Giovanni, uh, I'll come to you first. Um, what are the key elements to consider when choosing an insurance contract? Well, insurance contracts notor can notoriously be quite complicated to um, understand for someone which is not familiar with them. So my, my advice would be obviously to Consider three main points. Um, the most important thing is exclusions. You need to check carefully what's excluded from the cover to make sure that you're not, you're not breaking any rules there. And if there is a loss, it's not covered. Uh, the, the basis of valuation is the second most important thing to 
uh, consider when choosing a contract. And also make 100% sure that you've checked all the deductibles and the coinsurances because when there is a loss, that will be deducted from the amount agreed for the settlement. After you have taken these elements into consideration, it's very important then, after only after these, to consider the price. If you consider the price before looking at the conditions, you might get something wrong in the process. Great. Thank you, Giovanni. Renata, coming to you with the next question. How do you know you're choosing the right conservator or restorer? Well, the first thing is to make sure, of course, that the specialty goes with what you're looking at. So a painter and conservator for a painting, a watch conservator for a watch. Um, there are people who, be, who have several specialties and that's okay, but nobody can do absolutely everything. So if you go to a conservator and they say, I can do anything that you bring in, you have to ask yourself, is it they who are going to work on it? In which case you need to wonder where, what the level is, mm -hmm. or are they working with other specialists? In which case it's not a problem. It's simply a group of people and you're seeing just one. So I would look at what their specialty or specialties are. And of course, have they worked on similar types of objects before? Great. Tova, coming to you for the, for the next question. It's a bit of a a mouthful this one and one of everyone's favorite topics to be talking about. Um, Brexit is going to be happening on the 31st of December 2020 and it will have an effect on all industries that import and export. Our sector of course is no different. Is there anything that interior designers should be doing in order to prepare for this? Thank you. Um, I think that like you said this is Brexit affects everybody. Um, I think interior designers just need to be aware of a few things. The two most important is timing and cost. And of course, those two factors depend on how you interact with your suppliers. So suppliers will already know that they need to be declarers of goods coming in from the EU after the 31st of December, because we as the Great Britain become out of the customs union and what's called a third country. Um, if you already trade with um, or work with suppliers who are outside of the EU, you're going to be very familiar with the process. If you don't and you only know about the EU, you need to talk to your suppliers. You need to understand um, things like import VAT because import VAT for furniture is 20% of a declared value. So you need to know that that's an extra cost that will your client will have to take on. So you need to bring that into your margins and bring that into your pricings because obviously that's a huge part of the drive. So it's um, I, I, without going into specifics about every single designer, because every designer works differently with their suppliers, um, I would say consider timing and think about extra costs, both of transport and of import tax, import VAT at 20%. Okay, great. Um, Giovanni, I'm coming to you next. For what value of art should I consider precautions we're discussing when purchasing art? Is there a monetary threshold you'd recommend considering? So it's always important if you have an insurance contract that the valuations and the agreed values of the contract are always up to date. Um, it's also important considering the values um, to check the conditions of the contract that you have in place to make sure that you're shipping it with the right courier. Uh, because usually, if an artwork is valued more than £20,000, uh, you will not be able to insure it under a fine art insurance contract if you ship it by a non-specialized courier. And the same apply for fragile items, you can't ship them by courier, it needs to be specialized fine art pack packer and shipper. So I would say that the first direction you need to consider if it, if it is an artwork which is above 20, 30K, mm -hmm. and if it's a fragile item, there is basically no treasure. You need to make sure that everything you do, it's you know tailored for it. Since even if you pay for it very little, because otherwise you might get just destroyed in the right in, in the transit. Okay, thank you, Tova. I think this is probably one directed to you. And um, it would be good if the panel talked about shipping options designers could be aware of. For example, types of carriage in the UK, if abroad, sea, air freight, etc. So, I mean, I think that. Within the UK, you use trucks and every designer already has their sort of shipping method. If we're talking about art shipping specifically, like Giovanni said, that 20, 30K is really the, the most important number. And a lot of people in the art world use it as the base for whether or not they use a FedEx, DHL, parcel force, courier, 
option or a specialized art shipper, of which there are many um, in the UK and abroad. Um, and they all have connections. What's good about art shippers is that they all have connections abroad. So if you need to send something to you know, Djibouti, they will find you an agent mm -hmm. who will be able to help you with the customs from Djibouti to the UK, et cetera, et cetera. So um, carrying on from Giovanni, it's that threshold that really matters. Um, in terms of options, I mean, your options are you get what you pay for. If you go for, you know, FedEx, DHL, other options are available. You can, you're taking on a certain amount of risk, um, whereas a specialized arts shipper will be able to really give you, give a piece the attention that it needs. Okay. So yes, outside of the UK, sea freight, which obviously takes much longer, air freight, which is much faster, but more costly. So cost obviously comes into it as well. Okay, I, I, so I'm guessing it's a conversation you have to be having with your your client as well, and in fact, always time requirements and cost requirements. So it's cost, time, and risk. Those are the three elements that that you need to consider. I think when you're talking about shipping. Um, Amazing, thank you, um, Renata. Something that I've uh, had to deal with in the past before. A question on missing documentation for a piece that was purchased a few years ago. How do you go about rectifying it and making your documentations complete? Well, the first thing to know is that missing documentation, so gaps in provenance, that's actually much more common than we think. So if it is, if you do have a gap in provenance in one of your pieces, it's not the end of the world, but you do need to look into it. And if, for that, I would also call, I would always call on our provenance researchers. So there are people who specialize on that, who know how to do the research, who know where to go to look for the documentation, look into archives, who can travel to far distant places to look in this little archive in a little town to find the one piece of paper that says that it was sent or sold or what happened. So as with everything, I look at specialists. Um, if it's a piece that it's already in your collection, no need to worry about it. If it's a piece that you're buying and the seller has a gap in provenance, I would ask the question, why? And where the, what happened with that part? Were they not able to find the information? Did they not look for it? It happens. Uh, but if it's already in the collection, it happens. Breathe. It's okay. It can be resolved. Okay. And do you think it's worthwhile uh, collectors filling in the gaps in pieces that they have Absolutely. in their own collection? Absolutely. It goes back to having the full documentation, not only for your own purposes, insurance and others, but if you ever want to sell it, it, there's a risk in not having the proper documentation. Mm -hmm. um, if, if something ever, ever, ever happens to the actual piece, it just goes back to, well, and partly to insurance, of course, but also to just your own uh, having due diligence. Yeah. Also, if a person comes in saying, well, that piece was actually stolen from my family or from my house yeah. X number of years ago. If you have done your due diligence, therefore having all of the proper documentation, you can prove that it might have been stolen, yes, but it's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. Here's all the paper that proves it. You purchased it legally. You did your- you purchased it legally. It is technically legally yours. Of yep. course, then we go into another issue because it's also technically legally theirs. It got stolen. And that's where you can go into court and try to solve it, resolve it or see with a mediator. There are ways to work around it. If you don't have that, if you can't prove your own due diligence, mm -hmm. you'll be the one at fault here. Okay. If I can add something that is Definitely. very important from the insurance perspective is if all the due diligence is done and there is a genuine gap in the provenance, you can actually insure for defective title. So in case the title of ownership is not yours, but you've done everything you could to search um, in the provenance and the due diligence is completed, you can insure against that. And insurance would pay for the legal fees or just refund you for the value of the artwork. Um, another thing to consider when there is a gap in the provenance, which is genuine, you need to think about as this artwork, how old is the artwork? If it's a contemporary artwork, it might not be relevant. So you need to consider the age, the period of the artwork itself, and if it has been uh, published or sold publicly at auction before, or it has been in some exhibitions, because usually if they have been showed in public uh, and no claim has been advanced, usually if even if there is a gap in the provenance, insurers tend to worry less about it. If it's something that has been hidden in a vault for many, many years and it's coming for the market for the first time after a hundred years and no one has seen it and it has not been published, that is when it's coming to a risk because the public is going to see it for the first time and someone might make a claim on it. Yeah. 
if there is a gap in the duty in the provenance. And is there a particular term uh, for the type of insurance that covers that gap in, in information and provenance? Yes, it's called effective title insurance. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, I think it's probably relevant to all of you, but I'll throw it over to Toba to start. I'm looking at purchasing art and don't have much experience. What are the first steps you'd recommend? Uh, um, I think the first thing- Funny because we've had this conversation many times. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the, the best part about art is that you can have access to a lot of it. Um, I think the first thing that you have to do, I'm sure Renata will say the same thing, is that you have to hone in on your taste. You mm -hmm. have to understand what you like and what you don't like. And then you go into within what you do like, what can you afford? Um, and sort of move from there. If you walk into a gallery or a museum or not, not really a museum, but museum in terms of understanding taste, but if you walk into a gallery and you say, oh my goodness, I have such a reaction to this, I have to have it. And it's something you can afford. And all of your ducks, all of the gallery's ducks are in a row. They know where it's come from. They have a condition report. Go for it. I mean, go for it. it there's no reason why not. Um, but I think it's a lot about understanding your own taste first because art is so personal and then being smart about how you transport it, whether or not you have the right insurance, whether, you know, what documentation you need to have. I don't know if, I, I, I hope you agree with me. Yeah, Renata, maybe, maybe building on that question, a question I'd have is, um, you know, we deal with very different types of residential clients, clients who are buying because they like the art and they have that gut reaction. They walk into a gallery and they say, yes, it's perfect. We have clients that are buying filler pieces that have to complement the interior schemes that we're designing. But then we have clients who are just focused on investments. Um, and I guess that takes you into a different category of art. What advice do you give to clients who are wanting, yes, to hang it, display it in one of their homes, but it's an investment, purely investment piece, and they don't need it to, to say anything about their personal style or taste? Well, if it's an investment, then like any other investment, look at how the value of that type of piece or that artist, that style, uh, that representation, what is being represented, has, uh, if, how it has evolved in the last 10, 15, even 20 years. It also, of course, depends how quickly you want uh, to sell it and recover the investment. If you're thinking long term, long term, it's going to go into your vault for the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. If you're planning on selling it two years from now, you need to look at, at it from another perspective. Yeah. So I would see as long as it's an investment purely monetary, you have to look at it as from the point of view of any other investment. How have things evolved with this particular piece? And I mm -hmm. repeat again, it's both the artist, the type of piece. Are we talking about a painting or a sculpture? Mm -hmm. What is being represented? Because through time, we've seen that certain colors or certain images have sold better than others. So how has that particular representation evolved? And uh, how long are you planning on keeping it with you? And of course, is, will there be a difference in insurance value? And I'll take that to Giovanni. Yep. If you keep it for more or less time of where are you keeping it? Does that affect also how much you'll be have to spend on it basically as time goes by? Can I just add to that? If you are going to be buying things for just investment purposes, you need, as with any investment, there has to be diversity in the portfolio. Because like Renata said, things go in and out of trend. Something that might you think is going to be trendy in 10 years and completely flops. You yeah. need to be able to, like any investment portfolio, art is an alternative asset. It's the same in terms of risk. And, yeah, and, you and, have to, and you have to be willing to absorb that kind of risk. So I'm just carrying on to what. And, and Giovanni, I guess then, for, and I guess it's m more important uh, for somebody who's buying from an investment point of view um, to really take time to discuss with their, uh, with, with somebody in insurance like you, what the options are to them, the costs involved for, for storing or, or insuring a piece for a certain piece of or a period of time. Yeah, surely the insurance cost must be taken into account, but also you need to be very careful about the basis of valuation that there are in the contract that you're choosing to make sure that if something happens, you're not going to be, you know, your profit might not be damaged by by a wrong insurance contract that has been uh, has been done. And also, if you keep it in storage, it's very, very important that you just check regularly. Um, and if you have a very large stock in storage, make sure that you know it for each item where they are um, 
check regularly and also make sure who has access to these storage facilities because sometimes things might get lost so it's very important and if something get lost other stock taking um so under stock taking circumstances that might not be covered under your insurance contract if you just lost track of it um so you the storage situation is something also that needs to be kept monitored yeah. carefully and a quick question should you be doing regular um uh, condition reports on art that is in storage and maybe there for 5, 10, 15 years. Should there be regular? Depends on how it's packed, of course. If it's within a case, and usually the case has been prepared properly, there's more risk in opening it and taking it out because for every time you move a piece, it, there's a risk to it. So there, it's better to just leave it where it is and open it at the moment that you need it mm -hmm. and check. If it's going to be hanging on railings somewhere, Mm -hmm. Then yes, every so often, you know, once a year, once every two years, go and check, go and take a look, have a yep. condition report, even if it's just a basic checkup condition report, which mm -hmm. tend to be a little bit more basic. It's what they do, what they are is you bring your original condition report and you compare it to the piece in front of you and you note down, are there any changes? Yes, no. If yes, mm -hmm. which ones? And take proper pictures as always of everything. But it will depend really on how you've been storing it. Hmm. It's important that this is also agreed across the line with the client, insurers, and conservators, okay. so that everyone is on the same on the same side. Okay, I got, we have time for one more question. Uh, I know we're we're running over. Um, how do you set a budget with a client at an auction when a piece is estimated at a certain value, but then bidders send the bidding off the chart? Sure. Tova, I'll talk to you first, and then if anybody else wants to chime in before I, I wrap it up. Um, so I worked for dealers for 15 years before I started my company and um, communication with a client is always number one. Um, you have to, if you're looking at something that's in an auction, there's always an estimate. It's usually a range and you need to understand what is the upper bracket of your client's range. So if something is being auctioned for 80 to hundred thousand pounds and your client, you need to say to your client, well, what if it goes for 200 thousand what do you think what's your upper time and if you are sitting in an i mean if you go to ever go to an auction one day when we can do it in person again you will see a sea of dealers all on their telephones talking to their clients because that's they also act as agents that's what they do yeah. um i hate um questions about value because value is always subjective but it, you do have to sort of understand what's the value of this work to your client, not just monetary. So if the client says, well, I don't want to make, pay more than a hundred, you might say, okay, well, are you sure? And work with them a little bit. Great. Well, I think that's a lot of good advice from everybody. And thank you, Renata, Giovanni and Tova for joining us uh, for this conversation. I know I learned a lot. Thank you to Decorex for running and hosting this event. Uh, the Decorex team have informed me that there are still a few spaces left in Thursday's networking hour at 12.30 p.m. or um, yeah, p.m. If you would like me to, or if you would like to be involved, just head to the networking hour section on the platform and simply click the sign up button. Um, so thank you everybody. And uh, hopefully we'll do this again soon. Thank you. Thank you.